All right, going live here again and part of the breathing podcast. I wanted to do uh, a section on setup for uh, basically breathing. So uh, in 2008, created the art of breathing, DVD. Nobody has DVD players anymore. So, uh, and also have a training manual. So in today's video, I'm going to basically play the setup from the DVD. So I'll play the setup from the DVD and then also go into the pages of the book that um, may need reinforcement or anything. And this is for you because if you're going to embark on a, a training program or breathing, you know, obviously check your physician and all that stuff first. But um, I want to put you in a winning a position to have a good experience, a winning uh, position. So, and that's arming yourself, setting expectations, uh, what tools you'll need, and, uh, and knowing that, you know, even though you might feel like you're coming in as a novice, uh, we all learned how to breathe the same way, being born, slapped, and taking that first breath. So, anyway, uh, I'm going to start first with the setup for the art of breathing, uh, and this will be the video clip. Uh, from 2008 and then again I'll back it up with the book enjoy Zen healing the art of breathing. Right, let me just go past this a little bit blah 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 getting started So you're wondering why do I need to learn how to breathe isn't this something I've been doing all of my life well quite likely it is but most people breathe improperly. What is the detriment of that? Stress, toxic buildup, fatigue, anxiety. In this tape, we're gonna show you how to use your breath, use it as your armamentarium, different techniques on how to relieve stress at different periods of time during the day. So we have ones that'll help balance the brain, help balance the body and mind, some that'll help really reoxygenate the blood in a in a quick and efficacious way. We're here to break it down and show you some different techniques that you can use during the day to help wake you up, reduce fatigue, create better mental and physical health and well-being. Chronic pain, eating disorders, even patients clinically on psychotropic drugs and clinically diagnosed with ADD, you know, ADHD, have been able to get off their drugs because they've learned proper breathing, learned meditation, learned how to relax. So whatever you want to call it, whether it's you're a martial artist and you're controlling your breath, or you're a yogi and you're controlling your breath, or maybe you're in music and you need to learn, or you're a singer and you really need to learn how to breathe properly. Most people don't breathe properly. Most people don't breathe from their belly. They breathe from their chest. Did you know that the average person breathes about 17,000 times a day? But more interesting, they have about 60,000 thoughts a day. That means just about every breath that we take, we have about four thoughts. Well, you probably noticed that things like yoga are popping up in just about every strip mall across the U.S. So why is this once mystical practice, just like some of the martial arts that are popping up in all over the place, why are these things have such a grip on us? Well, a lot of it is because it teaches proper breathing. So yoga means union. Union of the body, of the mind, and of the spirit. Yoga also means union of the physical breath and the body. Noted yogi BKS Iyengar says that yoga is using the breath to still the constant fluctuations of the mind. Now some people think that the relationship to the longevity of how long you live is predicated by the amount and the number of breaths you take. So if that's true, that means that the less breaths that you take, the longer that you live. Would that be true? Well, let's look at the animal kingdom. When we look at a rabbit in the wilderness, a rabbit in the wilderness breathes about 100 times a minute. A rabbit in the wilderness lives for about a year. The average house cat breathes about maybe 70 times a minute. And the cat lives about 10 years. Same with the dog. Dog will breathe about 50 times a minute. And the dog will probably live maybe about 15 years. The average human will breathe maybe 25 times a minute, and maybe you'll live 75 years. Compare that to the tortoise, who breathes one time a minute, and may live close to 200 years. Maybe there's some truth to that. 
some of the techniques we're going to learn are the Durga breath, the Ujjayi breath, alternate nostril breathing, the dog breath, Sitali Pranayama, laughing. Did you say laughing? That's right, laughing. And we're going to show you the connection with laughing and your breathing. So you might be skeptical, but what do you have to lose? Try some of these exercises, try one of them every day, and it'll start to heal your body, create more energy and vitality, and perhaps even slow down the aging process. People may even notice, did you change your hairstyle? You look a little younger. Did you lose some weight? So again, using your breath to still the constant fluctuations of the mind. In this DVD, we're going to break down the science of breathing. We're even going to break down the mechanics of it. So let's start right now. You first have your inhale. Inspiration. Inspiration means inhalation or puraka. In inspiration, the respiratory diaphragm and external intercostals contract. There's the pause between your inhale and the next exhale. And then there's your exhale. And there's the pause between your exhale and the next inhale. Pause. Kumbhaka. Even when we completely expel all of our air, there still remains 1,200 milliliters of air, so expelling everything out would collapse the alveoli. The midline, also referred to as tandon in the martial world and bandhas in the yogic world, is of spiritual importance as it forms an oscillatory circuit with the brain. The brain is only equipped with sufficient energy to operate its switchboard of voluntary and involuntary impulses. This is why we can only sustain limited attention, as the brain needs to constantly rely on the physical body, in particular, the respiratory muscles, in order to control its thought. You came into this life when you were born, slapped, and <sighs> taken that first breath. So most people, when they're learning breathing, they're in a hurry to take that next breath. After you exhale, you're in a hurry to take that next breath. It's ingrained in us. So maybe just explore the pause is an area that actually can change the way that we breathe and can also change the relationship and the connection between our body, our mind, and our thoughts. Today's American doctors are now advocating the use of breathing techniques like yoga, but athletes have known this for years. Athletes like Tiger Woods, Michael Jordan, Evander Holyfield, who have all used the power and the science of controlling their breathing to enhance their physical performance and also change the outcome of their events. Tiger Woods draining a 24-foot putt on the 18th hole to win a match, controlling his breath. Michael Jordan in the zone, draining a buzzer beater to win the championship. Evander Holyfield, with somebody coming at him, physically flailing, using his breath to stay calm. Most martial artists and athletes alike will tell you, the one who's calm in the storm usually comes out on top, whether it's a physical outcome or it's something who's calm in the storm, even using your mental aptitude. Times you've been up to try and do a speech and you forget your words, it's because you can't control your breath. You're playing a physical sport and you can't think because your breath, you can't get your breath, you can't control your mental function. So the connection between your breathing, the connection between your lungs and your mental and physical aptitude and thoughts is everything. Keeping tension in the lower portion of the abdomen while breathing encourages both physical and mental stability. Now we naturally do this and provide ourselves strength when we bear the burden of the freezing cold or when we're in pain or experiencing sorrow or anger. You cannot bring the muscles of the rest of the body into play if you do not first bring the abdominal muscles into play. Even stroking a paintbrush, the simple act of writing, or even threading a needle can be affected by these movements. Artists connecting their concentration with a brush stroke, usually at the point of complete pause with their breath at the moment of their heightened concentration. Without the cooperation of the respiratory muscles, we cannot move any parts of our body. To prove this, bury a friend up to their neck in the sand at the beach and it's virtually impossible for them to laugh because their respiratory diaphragm is compromised. The rapid convulsions in our respiratory diaphragm 
our tool that we use. It's our body's natural defense mechanism. When internal mental pressure overwhelms us and needs to be immediately discharged, our respiratory organ is the only bodily agent that can handle this. Some anatomical points. So when you look at the anatomy of the thoracic cavity, you have three lobes of the lung on the right hand side and you have two on the left. And the lung and the whole respiratory system has a collateral effect. So what you take in on the left, it's all coming in the same, same way. It's coming into your, through your elementary canal, into your respiratory system, into the lungs. Your alveolar sacs are reoxygenating, taking that oxygen in and spitting back out carbon dioxide, helping to propel your blood through your whole body systemic system and creating that energy that propelling the blood around. So whether you're a martial artist and you want to call that chi or ki, or whether you're a yogi, you want to call that prana, or whether you're an athlete, you just want to call it, I've got that boost of energy. That's what it's about. As air travels from a high region to a low region, therefore it naturally enters via our nasal passages or our mouth and continues its path down the throat, passing through the larynx and pharynx, into the trachea, and eventually into the lungs, and into the alveolar sacs of the lung, where the alveoli in the lung, and the blood that enters the lung via the pulmonary arteries, helps induce oxygen back into our body's systemic system to provide and regulate the oxygen in your body, as your lungs then release the carbon dioxide back into the air. The respiratory center of the brain is responsible for controlling the breath, both the breathing rate and the ability to naturally regulate the amount of oxygen, carbon dioxide, and acidosis in your blood. There is in fact a voluntary and an involuntary control of your breathing that occurs naturally. Conscious or deliberate breathing is in fact attempting to consciously alter the body's natural involuntary response. This is similar to jumping on the Stairmaster to get your heart rate up so that your body can increase its oxygen levels ultimately speeding up your metabolism. So we have these tools right at our physical disposal. Oxygen flying around us. We have the physical tools here to take it in, to expel it out. So use those tools. It's really just a matter of increasing that awareness, and knowing when to use these techniques during the day. So whether it's in the morning or at work, or trying to come home in the evening and relax, we can have all these different techniques at our disposal. So the professional hockey team that has the hyperbaric chamber and puts the athlete in there in between periods in order to reoxygenate their blood, there is some secret to that. The oxygen bars that were popping up all over the West Coast are testament to that. All right, so I'm going to pause this right here uh, because, you know, basically with the environment, you, you want to pick something that uh, gives you comfort. There's not a lot of distractions. Uh, so nature, a lot of times, is a great environment. And you want to surround, you know, maybe surround yourself just like a meditation. Um, surround yourself with things that give you comfort, that make you feel powerful and good or connect you to your higher source. And... Um, you know, build from there. So, and a lot of this with the practice also is the attention with your posture and alignment. So that's what we call the, the, the physical piece of meditation. It's, it's why really in the eight limbs, you're doing the asana, the poses. So if you're in Lotus, you can sit for long periods of time and be in meditation and settle in, not be, oh, my legs hurt, or this is uncomfortable for me. So that's why you train the physical body so that you can endure the long periods of concentration in meditation and then work all the other movements within. So I'm going to go to the Art of Breathing book piece here. And again, this is just a piece of the training manual. And I love this quote that it opens up with. You know, yoga is, people think it's poses, but it's really using the breath to still the constant fluctuations of the mind. That's Iyengar. And that's, 
you know, the fluctuations of the mind and still in that uh, really goes with the mechanics of the breathing. So, you know, the pause of the breath, yogis know this, when you pause the breath, you still the fluctuations of the mind. So that's where when we got into the mechanics, uh, you know, breathe, it's, uh, one, you know, the mechanics of one breath is an inhale, then the pause, then the exhale, and then the pause. And obviously, we've gotten into that, and we'll continue to get into it, and what's really happening uh, with the body. And again, why to learn? Because basically what's happening in stressful situations, the emotional excitement is hijacking our breathing rate, making it irregular. So learning these conscious control breathing exercises, or even heightening your awareness around your breathing, can help you check emotional excitement in the moment when it happens. So this could be a tool for you. Again, it's hijacking you. So conscious control breathing can then halt emotional excitement. You got to do the opposite of it. So, you know, and that's, it enables meditation. So again, anybody who's really gotten into meditation, you know, it's you're riding your breath and you're using that to calm the chitavriti, the distractions of the mind and all that other stuff. And it's the discipline, bringing the discipline of the body. And uh, we know it removes toxins and aids in digestion and can reduce in fatigue and help reoxygenate us. And again, the facts that I love are 60,000 thoughts, 23,000 breaths. You know, we, we peak our respiratory function when we're in our 20s and it degenerates 9 to 25% every decade. And then the one I love is our respiratory function is responsible for eliminating up to 70% of our waste. That's all of our body waste. So we're all trying to jump on a Stairmaster and do this, all this other exercises without bringing the attention of our breath into it. So that's why even just doing some of these rigorous breath work exercises like breath of fire, cabal body breath, skull shining breath, uh, a lot of the expulsion breaths, you know, boxer breath that I'm teaching, which is basically cabal body breath, or even ha, or, uh, you know, sounds that are sharp. They're all things that are going to heighten, you know, it's basically escalating peristalsis within the body so that all our waste and all that stuff moves through us quicker. And as we know, we can survive without food for weeks and water for days, but oxygen only a few minutes. And most of our energy requirements come from air. And again, Logi, Yogi's life measured by the number of days, number of breaths. And we went over the animal kingdom on that. So maybe be the tortoise and breathe that one time a minute. Again, less breaths per, per minute, less breaths per life, longer life. That's the school of thought. And again, the mechanics, the inhale, the pause, the exhale, pause. So when we inhale, boom, we take that oxygen in. It can invigorate the body, you know, do its thing. We trap it in there with the pause. So that pause, again, it's not only still in the fluctuations of the mind, bringing us calmness, but it's also allowing that oxygen to seep into the physical body if we're not in a hurry to let it go, if we're willing to explore that pause. Then we have the exhale where we're letting go of the CO2, we're relaxing the intercostals, the respiratory muscles and diaphragm. So again, that helps in uh, pain management and um, relaxing the physical body, which also relaxes the mind. Uh, and then we have the exit, then we actually have our exhale again, getting rid of all that, uh, helping to balance this, the uh, pH levels, getting rid of that CO2. And then we have that pause afterwards. And the pause again, still in the fluctuations of the mind, but it's also where, you know, we could overcome, we help overcome trauma, let out all our breath. And, you know, instead of visualizing that trauma, because the fight or flight comes in when we let out all the breath. So instead of visualizing the trauma and going right to that, you know, you have to have something in your arsenal. You have to have the overcoming of it. So it's, you know, seeing yourself powerful next time in that situation, being uh, aware and alert or whatever, you know, your body and your unconscious might be speaking to you. You know, you have to kind of visualize the opposite. And it's the same if you're trying to use that for, you know, achieving a goal, um, you know, being, you know, seeing yourself on that podium, letting all that air out, seeing yourself on the podium, feeling the pins and needles of getting first place or whatever that is, you know, the crowd roaring or, 
you know, your parents looking on in uh, improvement and, and, you know, you feeling like you pleased them or whatever that thing that's going to keep you going, you know, or, or really motivate you, that's the thing, that's the moment you want to attach to all that air out of your body. So anyway, we'll get into that in subsequent episodes. And again, uh, air, it's like breathe air, breathe air, take a breath. Um, or when you have all your air let out already, even if you exhale all your air out, you still have five to 700 milliliters of air in there. It's still in your reserve, in your trachea, in your bronchus, in your throat, all that air, those reserve areas, just like a scuba diver. And remember the air that we're breathing anyway, um, even though we focus on oxygen and CO2, it's 79% nitrogen and then 21% oxygen and 4% CO2. So I'm always saying, man, there's probably a conspiracy around air. Uh, we should be saying, breathe in that nitrogen. I mean, heck, we have nitrogen pills um, and nitrous oxide and nitrogen bombs, but it's this element that just gets filtered out. I don't know. Anyway, the mechanics of breathing, help and pain management, talked about that with uh, the respiratory muscles, air traveling from a high low region, so you saw that in anatomy, respiratory, respiratory center of the brain, so again, that's really where when you get into the micro movement of these exercises, of doing them, you know, it's where you're bringing your locks or your, you know, atten your attention into the yoga, the, the bandhas or the har or the tandem, however, whatever you want to, you know, midline. Um, you're sealing things in with your bandhas or your locks. So um, sealing that air that, that you're in, taking in through the pranayama. So that's again when you're doing exercises like the microcosmic orbit, where you're using your locks and your uh, you know, pranayama and all that, your posture and alignment, your inner focus, all of it, you know, trying to see where that goes. And again, posture and alignment, you, the main thing is you want to be stacked. So even, you know, here where I'm in hero position, trying to keep the head stacked over the chest and the hips and all that and being in a comfortable position. So if my legs are screaming to me, nah, that's not it. You know, get, get into a chair or prop yourself up with some pillows or bolsters or different tools that we have. So picking the posture that's good for you, full lotus, half lotus, modified Burmese, you know, hero position, in a chair, uh, supine, corpse pose, you know, lying flat down with your palms up, just like anatomical position in the operating room. Uh, anyway, so, but finding, you know, a lot of that, even lying supine puts your respiratory diaphragm for, re for breathing at a really good position. So it's a great position to do. Um, you can even do it in bed, but you just don't want to be collapsed in bed with your respiratory diaphragm. And again, the attention to the midline. So to take these techniques, once you start really trying them on, and then you're saying, well, I'm just doing the same thing over and over. No, you have to do the micro movement, the internal micro movement. And that's where you're bringing the attention and the tension, the attention and the tension into the midline. And then you're using some of these things like even third eye, you know, you're closing the eyes and you know, basically um, drowning out the other senses, you know what I mean? Really focusing, bringing the body internally. Um, and again, breath work and breathing less and taking full breaths. It said the ancient times that the samurai crossing the bridge would take only three breaths. And then again, we talked about the burying a friend in to the sand up to their neck and how if the respiratory diaphragm is compromised, that's really hard to do any of these breathing techniques or meditation and all that. So um, broken ribs, like I've had broken ribs a bunch of times and some big traumas. And it's been hard to, at times, you know, hard, harder to do the meditation and, and breath work than it is even to move around and do physical stuff. Uh, let's see, again, the concentration. Buddha taught 84,000 different ways to still the emotions. But the simplest thing to do is just pay attention to your breath. And breathing allows us to meditate. And, you know, this is just in teaching. Some of the different cues that we use as teachers, 
You know, just breathe or notice the pause between breaths. Breathe freely. Check in with your breath. Continue to breathe and find your own breath. And, and I'm, I'm kind of making fun of it because that's kind of what we have to kind of reinforce to ourselves as teachers to remind students. But as, as teachers, we're really students. And, and like I'm reading that and I'm like, heck yeah, man, I need that reminder. I needed it just to say that because I need to remind myself, hey, keep on breathing during the day when these different distractions come up. So again, it's learning how to limit the distractions, the chitavriti of the mind, which there's a separate video on that. And again, the general principles of pranayama or breath work, um, yeah, breath, breathing exercise, never push them to the point of weariness or exhaustion. So it's not the gym. And even these exercises, I'm, put, I'm laying them all out here, but they shouldn't be repeated too often and not at all m merely mechanical or in haste or hurry. So it's not like you, you don't be robotic when you're going through this kind of stuff. And you also don't rush into it. You know, it talks a lot about it in, um, you know, Patanjali. It's like the practitioner has to go slowly or they can really do damage to themselves. And so there should be a variety and a good change in the exercises and gentle and nonviolent, never jerky, but it's smooth and continuous. And if you're emotionally upset or tired, you might naturally intuitively go to that, a cry or a sigh is your body doing that breath work. So riding that, but, or doing a little bit and then you find yourself releasing that emotion. So that kind of helps you uh, ease into it. That's a good way. But what they're talking about there is just like going through it and then just, you know, trying to do pranayana exercises to deal with it. And what you want to do is, you know, you could be using your breath, but you want to be starting to deal with that emotionally, dealing with that internally as it's coming up, not just then switching on, switching off. So again, different props and tools, aside from the physical ones, third eye gaze, and that could be, you know, the drishti or your, or your gaze point. That could be your tip of the nose, eyebrow, your navel, um, the hand, the toes, of far far left or far right, thumbs up to the sky, any of these different um, techniques, they're all, you know, your bandhas, uh, even chanting sometimes, they're all things that can just keep you in the moment, even the ujjayi breath, you know, that's, the, that's you know, I do the ujjayi breath when I'm meditating because it's, I just rushed it, but, you know, that's allowing me to ride my breath, and it's an audible breath, so it's reminding me, hey, if I don't, you know, if I'm not hearing that, if I'm not staying in the breath, then I'm probably uh, waning, and my mind's probably waning a little bit. So, anyway, we're going to get into belly breathing and Durga breath in the subsequent episodes, the Nadi Sadhana, older nostril breathing, which I love, uh, help to balance the hemispheres of the brain, and um, chill you out, and all that deal. The Ujjayi breath, again, the ocean sounding breath, the four, seven, eight breath, uh, Satali or Satakar, the cool down breath. I love that one as well. That really can help aid in digestion, especially when you have like heartburn and you're like, man, I need some Rolaids or some Tums. Uh, so that's the cool down breath. You got dog breath, which is great if, for anybody who's dealing with uh, addictions and things like that, help clear out the old lies in the throat. Maybe speaking the truth a little bit. Um, Kabbalah body breath, breath of fire, you know, skull shining breath, boxer breath. Um, they're all expulsion breaths. Help to release internal tension. Um, you know, activate the lymphatics, uh, prevent illness maybe. Um, clear out the lungs and strengthen, you know, reduce mucus, those type of things. All the, just the things that are happening when you're doing... <laughs> like a boxer when you're doing that expulsion breath. And that's what I talk about again with the expulsion breath. You know, the, your respiratory function being responsible for eliminating 70% of your body waste. That's the same thing that's happening. You're doing <laughs> breath of fire. And that's building a tremendous amount of heat up into your body. And, you know, if we're, uh, uh, we're a tremendous amount of water, so that heat is helping to evaporate, even evaporate some of that belly water, the, 
the water that's in the belly contents, theoretically, you know, helping to deal with that. And we, then we have to also deal with the microbiome and all that deal of our gut. <laughs> so anyway, laughing also, and again, laughing has the yin and the yang version. So the yin version that we see in yoga classes with laughing yoga and <laughs> and that's a good little sharp expulsion, more of a yin version, a soft, uh, uh, a non-invasive version. And then you have the yang version where it's more ha, hu, ha, hu, where it can be forceful and powerful. And you see that show up in, you know, martial arts with uh, the katsu shout, the zen shout. So that's also one of our exercises that we do. So anyway, in the different episodes in here, we're going to get into some of the different breaths. And I'm going to cut it short here. And then we'll end with, again, a quote. Just an old 2,000-year-old quote, Chinese adage. If you know the art of breathing, you have the strength, wisdom, and courage of ten tigers. So go out there, guys. Be fierce. Be gentle. Be loving. Use some of these techniques that you're going to learn, uh, but set the foundation right now. And I'll see you guys next time where we'll do a little bit of practice. You guys have a, a great day. Stay in. Stay in the light, breathe well, stay flexible, keep healing, keep breathing.